Hello. Welcome to the Royal Holloway Geography for Schools lecture series. My name is Simon Armitage and I'm a professor in the Department of Geography here at Royal Holloway. Today we're going to be talking about the formation of dunes in hot deserts. For the last 20 years or so I've been working in and around the drylands of Arabia and Africa and I'm going to start this lecture by showing you a few images from these drylands. This, for example, might be your idea of a desert. Certainly the rolling dunes in the background probably are. In the foreground, there's a groundwater-fed lake, effectively a lake caused by a large spring. This is a particularly striking example from the Fezzan Basin in southern Libya, but actually the Sahara is dotted with large and small oases like this. These are the dunes in the background of that previous image. So they're part of the Ubari Sand Sea, again in southern Libya. This image is from the other end of Africa. This is near Sosasfle in Namibia. The dunes are part of the Namib Desert. One of the things to notice here is that the foreground of the picture is gravel. The dunes aren't part of a continuous sand sea like they were in the previous slide, but instead they form discrete sand ridges on parts of a gravel and bedrock plain. The other thing to notice is there are trees and bushes in this photograph, and that indicates that this landscape is wetter than the one I showed you in the previous slide. This time we're in Saudi Arabia. In the background you can see dunes, and again there's a little bit of vegetation there. However, in the foreground there's a white rock, and this material is referred to as diatomite. Rather like limestone, diatomite is composed of the skeletons of vast numbers of tiny waterborne creatures. In fact, what you're looking at here is the remnant of an ancient lake, which formed in a hollow between two dunes during the last interglacial, about 125,000 years ago. At this time, the Arabian Peninsula was much wetter than it is now. Interestingly, the surface of this lake, the surface of this diatomite, is covered in footprints. For example, there are human footprints, but also camels and elephants too. In this slide, we're back in the Sahara, again in southern Libya. There are no dunes close to this location, but actually the rocky, gravelly landscape shown here is typical of very large parts of the Sahara. The mound of rocks in the middle of the photo isn't natural. This is the remains of an ancient hearth. So when the region was quite a lot wetter, about 7,000 years ago, um, there were a number uh, of encampments in this area and they left literally hundreds of hearths lying around the landscape. My rationale for showing you the last two slides is to highlight two important things that should interest us as geographers about deserts and drylands. The first of those is that they change over time. Both the Sahara and the Arabian Peninsula have been much wetter in the past, and they probably will be again. Conversely, the Kalahari Desert in southern Africa has been much drier than it is now in the past. More importantly, from a human perspective, there's every reason to expect it to get drier again in the future too. And this means that whenever we study dryland landscapes, we must consider the long-term role of water and wetter conditions, as well as present-day aridity. The second important thing to note is that when desert areas are wetter, they're home to a lot of people. It seems quite likely, for example, that wet conditions in the Sahara and the Arabian Peninsula were critical in allowing our species to move out of Africa and into Arabia, and then subsequently to become a globally distributed species that we are today. And that, of course, brings me on to the last reason to study deserts and drylands. 50% of the Earth's land surface is dryland, we tend to forget that because we live in the only continent where drylands aren't a major component of the landscape. And lots of people live in drylands, which means that understanding them properly is vitally important. So what's the difference between deserts and drylands? Well, deserts are the dry core areas, the lighter colours on this map here. The hyper-arid and arid regions that you see on the map. The Sahara, Arabia and Central Asia are noticeably the core of present-day aridity but there are substantial deserts in every continent except Europe. The desert margins or fringes are the semi-arid and dry subhumid regions. When you're studying these areas, it's well worth remembering that they've often been much drier than they were in, in the present day in the past. So quite often semi-arid and dry subhumid regions have been considerably drier and their landforms um, bear the impact of those drier climates. For example, much of the semi-arid part of the Kalahari in southern Africa consists of large dunes which have subsequently been covered in grassland. It's very much a dune landscape, even if the dunes haven't been active for a long time. 
The term drylands, as the slide says, covers everything from hyperarid deserts to dry subhumid regions. So, what do those four landscapes look like? You've seen this slide before. This is the hyperarid Ubari Sand Sea in, the southern Lib in southern Libya. Probably what you think of when you think about a desert. This is an arid landscape. It's fairly typical of the arid landscape in southern Tunisia. So we're on the northern fringes of the Sahara here. There's some vegetation, but actually there's quite a lot of bare ground too. This is a semi-arid landscape, in this case uh, in the Namibian portion of the Kalahari. Obviously the main point of this photo is that there's a massive rainstorm in the background, but actually the landscape consists of inactive linear dunes covered by grassland and the occasional tree. It's an example of a semi-arid landscape where the underlying geomorphology is a dune field which formed under much drier conditions. Here we see a dry subhumid landscape with a lot of vegetation. So, from the last four slides, we can see that dryland landscapes can vary enormously. Now we're going to focus on the formation of dunes in the deserts, as it says in the title. So, the first question to ask about the formation of dunes is where does the sand come from? And I bet you hadn't thought about that question. But you can't have a dune without sand, and sand is frequently not produced in the desert itself. Sand is almost always the product of water, either in rivers or at the coast. The red oval highlights the Namib Sand Sea on this slide. So we're in Southern Africa and the red oval is in Namibia, just north of South Africa. Like I say, the red oval highlights the Namib Sand Sea, which is part of the Namib Desert, which covers the entire coastline of Namibia. The image on the right is what these look like on Google Earth. So these are the linear dunes that are part of the Namib Desert and they stretch for about 400 kilometres from the South African border up to Warwick Bay. On the right, we can see what those linear dunes look like at ground level. So where does the sand come from for these linear dunes? Well, the sand mostly comes from the Orange River, which drains almost all of central southern Africa. With the blue line, I've indicated where the lower course of the river flows, but tributaries actually collect water and sediment from much of the continental interior. That sediment's then moved into the Atlantic, where the Benguela Current moves it northwards. Coastal processes then move that sand on land. Once the sand's on land, the predominant wind sweeps it northwards, producing large linear dunes, which is what we can see in the lower half of the image on the right. These end very abruptly at the Kwiseb River, where the annual floods wash away the advancing dunes. So dunes encroach into the dry riverbed in the dry season, but get washed away again in the floods in the wet season. This leaves a very stark contrast between the sand-rich Namib Sand Sea to the south and the sediment-starved central plain of the Namib Desert to the north. This is a really nice case study showing a sand sea acting as a sediment conveyor belt. Here, Sand comes in from the Orange River via the Benguela Current, accumulates and slowly moves northwards due to southerly winds, remember winds are named after the direction they come from, before finally being deposited back into the Atlantic by the Kwiseb floods. And here we have just have uh, labels showing the Namib Sand Sea to the south and the central Namib Plain to the north. Here's the Kwiseb Valley, with the linear dunes encroaching onto the riverbed from the right and no dunes in the left of the image. So you see these linear dunes are very big, they're big landscape features and they're encroaching into a relatively small river. But because that river floods annually and floods uh, really quite uh, powerfully, it removes the end of these dunes and stops them uh, crossing the river valley and moving into the plain to the north. Another source of sediments for dunes is riverbeds, particularly where the bed dries out and floods seasonally. Here, floods deposit sands on the floodplain, but during the dry season the floodplain dries out, the vegetation dies back, and sands blown out by the winds. This process is referred to as deflation. This image here is from, the, from Zambia, where the Upper Zambezi River deposits sediments in the Barotsi floodplain, and this is an area I've indicated in blue here. The white arrows then indicate the movement of sediments out of the floodplain during the dry season, forming linear dunes. 
The Lily dunes are actually quite difficult to see in this Google Earth image because the dunes are quite old. I think the youngest of them are about 5,000 years old and they're now covered in vegetation. But they're the horizontal bands of light and dark ground that you can see in the left of this image. Another potential source of sand includes coastal erosion of soft sandy sediments. This is what appears to be going on in the Wahiba sands of Oman, which is what we can see on the right of this slide. Here, carbonate sands in coastal cliffs are being eroded and blown on land by wind. Three different phases of dune formation have been identified, and I'm just about to pop them up onto the slide. So here's the first one, here's the second, and here's the third. In general, we can say that any fluvial or coastal region which can produce or receive sediment can be a source for sand for sand dunes. What happens next depends on sediment availability, wind conditions and topography. And over the next few slides we're really going to think about sediment availability and wind conditions. Obviously to create dunes you need a source of sediment, which is what we've just been discussing. But once you have that sediment, it also needs to be able to move. The main thing which stops sand blowing about is vegetation. So in the UK we have lots of sand, uh, sandy beaches, but coastal dune fields don't extend very far inland because they're stabilised by vegetation. So although there's lots of sediment, it's not available, it can't move around, it can't produce very big dune fields. However, in arid and hyperarid reasons, this doesn't happen which is why we typically associate dune fields with deserts. The second thing we need to create dunes is wind to move the sand about. Wind direction, or more accurately whether wind blows in the same direction all year or from more than one different direction, is one of the main controls of dune type. The other is sediment availability, i.e. whether there's a lot of sand or only a little bit. So here are the two factors that control uh, dune formation and to some extent dune type. This image shows some of the variety of dune types that can occur. In each case the arrows indicate the predominant wind direction. With the exception of the parabolic dune at the top right of the image, these dunes forms form where little or no vegetation is present. In addition to these basic dune types, compound forms can occur, for example where smaller dunes are superimposed onto the main ridge of a linear dune. This can make it quite difficult to identify dune type, but the key thing to do is to focus on the main shape of the dune and use that to guide your identification. Looking at figures A to C, we see the dune types formed under unidirectional wind conditions, that is to say wind essentially blowing from the same direction all year round. As we move from the top to the bottom, we see the dune forms that you get with relatively little sand, relatively little sediment availability at the top, and far more sand, far more sediment availability at the bottom. So bark and dunes form where the wind's unidirectional and sediment supply is limited. Whereas transverse dunes form where we have unidirectional winds, so the wind blows from the same direction all year, but also abundant sediment supply. Figures E to G show the effects of vegetation, in this case on parabolic dunes, and also more complex wind regimes, for example with the longitudinal dunes and the star dunes. Longitudinal dunes go by a number of different names. They're also referred to as linear dunes, which is what I'll call them, and seaf dunes. And they form where the wind regime is predominantly bimodal. That is to say you've got two main directions of wind. Very often these are seasonal winds, one blowing in one direction, one blowing in another. However, there still needs to be a clear direction of sediment movement. So as you'll see in panel F of this image here, We've got two winds, they're still essentially blowing from the left of the page to the right of the page, and that gives you sand direction from, uh, sand movement in the direction of left to right. Linear dunes are quite common. The other thing that we see is a star dune. A star dune forms under uh, much more complex wind regimes and essentially is a mound of sand with a series of limbs leading away from the central mound. Star dunes are relatively rare in the landscape. The next thing we're going to do is to look at each of those dune types in turn.
So first of all, we're going to look at bark and dunes. These are two images of bark and dunes with the diagram on the right. As I said earlier, bark and dunes indicate unimodal, unimodal winds with limited sediment supply. They're migrating forms, which means that essentially uh, they move in a direction according to the direction that the wind is blowing them, and they move horn first. The upper image here is from the Sahara, whereas the lower image is from Mars. But essentially you can see winds at the planet's surface producing essentially the same dune type. A really important feature of all dunes is the slip face, and I've indicated that here on the Saharan Barkan dune. The slip face is the steeper face of the dune. This is always on the downwind side of the dune. So in these images, we can see the position of the slip face on the right of each of the dunes tells us that the wind is blowing from the left to the right. So the slip face is on the downwind side of the dune. That's really quite useful when we're trying to work out wind direction from looking at a dune. Though of course with a bark end dune, you can always look at the direction the horns are pointing. A bark end dune is migrating in the direction that the horns are pointing. These are barkanoid ridges. Like bark ends, they form under a unidirectional wind regime, but they form when um, sediment supply is much higher. These are transverse dunes. Again, they form under a unidirectional wind, but with an even larger sediment supply than we have with the barkanoid ridges. The key feature for identifying transverse dunes and to differentiate them from linear dunes is that they have only one slip face, and that's indicated in this diagram here. Linear dunes have two slip faces. So this is a diagram of a linear dune. Uh, as I've said earlier, they're also called longitudinal or sieve dunes. And they form when you have a medium amount of sediment supply, but also a bimodal wind regime that is generally pushing the sand in one direction. These are examples, again, from the Narmib Sand Sea, which I referred to earlier in this presentation. Unlike transverse dunes, they have slip faces on both sides of the ridge. The other thing you tend to see when you look at linear dunes is that they tend to be more or less triangular in cross-section, whereas transverse dunes are wedge-shaped. Individual linear dunes can be enormous, so they can be up to 300 metres in height, but they can also extend for tens to hundreds of kilometres, so they store absolutely vast amounts of sand. These are star dunes, which are dunes with three or more limbs, so three or more little dunes radiating away from a central mound of sand. They indicate variable or polymodal wind direction. Essentially, they're mounds of sand with a number of different limbs radiating outwards. Because they grow upwards, as opposed to migrating sideways, they become very large indeed, with some Chinese examples reaching up to 500 metres in height. The last dune type I want to talk to you about is a parabolic dune. These are parabolic dunes in Mozambique. Parabolic dunes form where vegetation stabilises the limbs of the dune, but pulses of sand can move between the two ridges which form the limbs of the dune. In this photograph, I am stood on one of the dune limbs looking upwind towards the next pulse of sand, which is travelling towards me. So, I've now talked about the main types of dunes that you get in hot deserts. Thank you very much for listening.